Welcome to the Story Department channel for our masterclass about screenwriting and the law. We're covering a whole range of topics. Uh, we talk about script registration, we talk about copyright infringement, about getting your ideas hacked and stolen, how to negotiate your option and purchase agreement and things like that. Uh, our guest today is experienced entertainment lawyer Rob Reed. Let's have a listen to what we need to keep in mind before we start asking questions. I think the, the important thing to realise is that you're dealing with um, a product or property that you are creating. As writers, once you write it, you've created a property which, depending on the circumstances, but generally speaking, is your, is your property. Uh, what you own in that is, an, is intellectual property. It's called copyright. I know you're all well and truly aware of that. And... And that is a valuable property, but you need to be careful that you're dealing with it from the word go in a manner that doesn't leave you exposed later on. So it really is a matter of trying to put things in place uh, from the word go. Once you start to, um, to uh, market or, or pitch your properties, then it's that point in time that you need to be aware of what your rights are. Um, I'm a lawyer. Of course, I have a, an interest in saying, yes, you need to see lawyers uh, fairly on, but let me assure you, you do need to see lawyers fairly on, uh, fairly early on, uh, because if you get the thing right from the start, then that should see you well uh, all the way through, and you're not going to find yourself in the courts. The other thing is that um, as writers, you'll be aware that, um, and I've acted for many production companies over the years, um, that there's three words called chain of title, and, and they are crucial to um, the product you're producing if you want to see it get onto, onto a screen because if you can't establish for uh, the producer and the financiers um, a good chain of title to the property that you're now seeking to include in that project, be it a script or whatever else you might be writing, um, then you've got nothing because without chain of title, um, the, the, the film or the TV program will not get up. It's that simple. So that's really important to keep that in mind in terms of when you start writing, who you start writing with, the circumstances in which you're writing. Um, keep all those things in mind. And as we sort of answer the questions, hopefully some of the, uh, the traps, and there are traps there, but if, if you're aware, they're not traps. They're simply things to be aware of to put in place as you're going through it. So I think I'd rather, in a sense, rather than be giving a lecture to you about copyright law and what you need to do uh, or don't do on the way through. I'd rather answer questions, perhaps be able to give you some factual examples of which, which we've been involved in, but perhaps also give you a bit of insight from, uh, from the production company point of view, uh, because they, at one point in, in time, they're, they're your best friends, uh, but they're also, they also want to own you. Um, so that's, that's just something to be aware of. Um, as a production company, obviously, if you're paying uh, for uh, a literary work, which is a, a script or whatever they might be getting from you, um, and if you're paying good money for it, then your your intention is uh, you want to own it and have all rights to it. So that that's then when the negotiation starts is okay. If you own the rights, then what what is the uh, get back for me as the writer? Uh, in terms of you exploiting what I've written. And what is important is that as you create your work, you are aware of all the various rights that go into your screenplay. That could be your own creation, but could also be things that you've picked up elsewhere and that, that have copyright in their own uh, right, whether that's a song or a piece of text, a quote, or a book. And it's, it's useful to record that. It's also, also useful to keep records of what you create when, so that further down the track, if ever there were to be a dispute, you can produce the evidence that you are the originator. Because at some point, and um, I'm not sure whether that made the cut of uh, today's class, but at some point you're going to sign an agreement where you uh, indemnify the producer for possible litigation about what you've written because you, you state that what you create is original so you take that responsibility which opens you up to uh, litigation if ever anything happens you are where the buck stops so the producer will say ah oh, well look i've got i've got this agreement um you can't sue me you gotta sue the writer 
So that is, that's why it's really important to know where the copyright originates from and to make sure that you have the right to that. Now, copyright is, a, is a, a, an international event, it's an international given. We deal in, in rights internationally. Movies travel the borders. Uh, you can't really recoup the cost of a feature film any longer within one territory. And therefore, copyright has become quite internationalized. However, copyright law is not the same everywhere. There are quite um, radical jurisdictional differences depending where your work is being exploited. Um, so yes, you do need to come across to get across those quite well. Um, if, you're, if your work's going to be exploited in an overseas country, um, that's initially exploited rather than being incorporated into a work that's like a film that's being exploited overseas. But if you're giving rights to an overseas producer, for example, then you need to be aware of what the rights are in that particular jurisdiction. And that can change quite a bit. But you're quite right, Carol, there's a, more of a uniformity uh, of approach being taken with, with a number of acceptance. And, and one of those really just the duration of copyright. There's been a, uh, in, in across the world uh, quite a few different um, uh, lengths of period of time uh, with, in which copyright subsists until, until it expires. There's a general trend to try and bring that into conformity across all jurisdictions. That's still not quite the case, but we're a lot closer than we were 15, 20, 20 years ago anyway. We're going up to our next question. When is it time to think about getting advice and, and hiring a lawyer? At which point in the creative process? Essentially, as soon as you start writing, you're creating copyright material. Now, there is an indicate. there has to be something, uh, some degree of uniqueness about it in order for it to be, to give a copyright status. But because you are writers, you are going to be creating what one assumes to be often are original works. So whether it's a screenplay, a treatment, whatever it might be, at that point in time, you are creating a copyright material. So that's when it starts to be exactly that from, yep. from the word go, pretty much. And what is being protected is the text is not necessarily what is behind the text. It's not the ID. It's not the story. It's the words that are being protected, which gets you in an interesting position when you, are, when you write a synopsis because the synopsis text itself, the way you write that synopsis may be protected by copyright as you write it, it's provided that a certain amount of effort goes into it and there's a certain amount of uniqueness to it. But the ID, the story behind that synopsis may not be protected. This is what Rob says about this. A synopsis is often an encapsulation of some ideas. If a person then takes those ideas and puts them into a different format, then very often you can't claim copyright or copyright infringement if they've simply taken it the next step, what you've encapsulated ideas, and they're not actually using the work that you've created in order to advance that idea in, in written form. So if they then take slams of your synopsis, if it's a lengthy one, um, and use that in what they're doing now, then they are infringing your copyright. But the idea or the concept behind your copyright um, is not something that's easy to protect. It's, it's the document itself. It's the written word. Um, now, my question to Rob was, would it be realistic to expect that you don't need any legal advice up to the point when you're going to talk to a producer about a contract? I think the only advice I'd give as a, as a lawyer to any of you who are writing things is there's a little thing called a copyright notice, which is the, the C in the circle, then the date and your name. If you're, crea if you're disseminating any material that you have written simply for information, then you have copyright in that material. But my advice to any, any person who's creative writers at all is that you should get used to using a footer on what you write, uh, and that ought to be circle copyright, year and your full name, and whack it on the bottom of every page so that when that goes out, it is telling the world that you're claiming copyright in that material. So that copyright notice doesn't change anything to your rights. What you do by putting it on your documents is you're marking your territory. You're basically, um, in a way, um, dissuading others from stealing your material. Now, it may happen and I've heard a lot of horror stories of people who believe that their idea was stolen. Um, one was about someone who attended a film market and in the same hotel there was another producer who then the next year had an idea that was 
exactly like the script that they had brought to that market but had not shown to anyone. So were they hacked? And what should you do in the case you feel that something like this has happened to you? So if you're claiming that you're, you're, you're someone has infringed your copyright, in fact, using your material, well, the first thing you need to do is to get some evidential basis for that. Normally that is seeing what it is that they're actually propagating or, or disseminating through um, to other people. If it's your work, uh, then clearly there is an infringement. If it's about the same topic but quite different textually from your work, then you've got a much more difficult process to follow. So it really depends on what the what they've put into their document. Uh, obviously, when I say document, I mean normally in soft copy now. What the words are they've used and how similar they are to the words that you've used to see that then creates that evidence, if you like, that indeed these aren't original thoughts and, in fact, they have been infringing your rights. It's really a matter of degree. I asked Rob also what his own experience was with infringement, whether any of his clients had this, uh, this case where they, their material had been stolen? Probably the best example. It's not a writing example, um, but it is an ideas type example, which, it, which I was involved in personally. Um, and, and that was that uh, years and years ago, a company I was working with, we pitched a, a program uh, to, uh, to a commercial radio, a commercial television station uh, for, for doing up um, a block, a block of units. And, and having people, um, you know, each, each contestant uh, being involved in, in one of the different units. And, uh, and yeah, and, and uh, say not too much, but uh, that wasn't picked up by the broadcaster. But very shortly, they had a program which was very similar to it. But that's the problem about protecting ideas. So I've now, look, I personally haven't had a case where there's been uh, in effect, uh, an infringement of copyright saying you've pinched my material, but there are lots of cases about that. What is interesting that I've heard a similar story from a writer who was at the same time also a lawyer, and he had put together an idea for a reality TV show, had pitched it to a network, the network rejected the idea, and lo and behold, in the next production season, they were developing that particular idea, and he was a lawyer. And couldn't do anything about it because it was the idea he had pitched and they didn't print or copy any of his documents. Now, what happened here most likely was a breach of, of confidentiality. The question of, of confidential information um, is, is an important one to keep in mind. The problem with it is establishing its confidentiality if you don't establish it as being confidential when you first start uh, sharing with other people. Um, so if you're if you've got an idea that you want to share, uh, my advice that's in my advice is you do need a lawyer at that point in time or a good confidentiality agreement so that before you actually convey that idea to anybody, you have them sign a confidentiality agreement which acknowledges that this is your property. It says they won't use it for any purpose other than to assist you, etc. So I think confidential uh, information uh, is certainly a, a, another avenue um, apart from owning intellectual property. And it's more applicable, I think, to those idea concepts where you've actually written them down. Once we, the screenwriters, are ready to go out with our work and negotiate with producers, then what we want out of that typically would be an option and purchase agreement. I asked Rob about that particular contract. The, the option to, to purchase your literary property is normally what a producer will do as next stage. Uh, those documents, I'm sure some of you are familiar with them, uh, they'll then seek to have a right to, excuse my phone, the background didn't turn down. Um, they often will seek to have a right to further develop it or have you further develop it. And, uh, and at that point in time, uh, you're still the owner of what's happening because it's not yet an option that's being exercised. If they then like it, then they will actually exercise the option Generally, at that point, that's when then all of the all of the property is assigned across to them, and they'll have you sign. It's normally an attachment to those option documents. They'll have you sign a deed of assignment, which effectively assigns all rights across to them. Now, that's not doesn't have to be the case. There's all, there's all sorts of um, issues that need to be resolved in terms of your right to be involved in the project uh, further on, uh, your remuneration. 
uh, for the work you've done, your entitlement to be credited, uh, your involvement uh, in spin-offs and sequels, etc. if there are any in, t- in terms of a, often a right to be involved in writing those or a first, a first refusal right to be involved in those. There are so many issues involved in negotiating what happens once your property is taken up by a producer that, that you need to be savvy or, frankly, you need to get a lawyer with experience to help you through it. You don't have to give away all your rights. And, and the, higher, the higher the uh, profile of a writer, uh, the more they're able to negotiate uh, the deals they do. And, and there's plenty of high-profile writers who negotiate uh, back-end shares, all sorts of things that are uh, ongoing, almost sort of residual, not necessarily residual payments, but certainly contingency payments depending on the performance of the film. Uh, they reserve to themselves uh, the right to be uh, uh, to write any spin-offs, etc., uh, that follow from it. Um, there are lots of things that can be done to give you an ongoing interest and indeed an ongoing financial interest in your property once a producer takes it up. So you've just got to be cautious. It's hard if you're a writer trying to break into the field uh, because the first thing when you get a, a, per, a person wants to take up your work, um, that's all your dreams have come true. Um, and producers are savvy enough about that to realise, well, okay, uh, we will want to own this. Um, the other side of the coin there is if it, if it does work well, then they know they've got someone who they can go back to who's a reliable source of good product. It is good to be realistic and to know that in terms of negotiation room when you're a beginner, in terms of the big deal terms, there's not really much you can do. However, there are very the many aspects to copyright negotiations and it's good to be aware of those areas that are not that important to a producer. Pro- producer will initially ask for everything as Rob earlier said, they'll try to own you. They'll try to get and keep everything about your work for as long as they possibly can, indiscriminately. While there are some elements of those rights that they may never use, they don't even intend to use, but it's just simpler to have a blanket assignment or blanket ownership. Now, when you have a good lawyer, you can find out what it is that this producer doesn't value as highly as the other rights. And, and that way you can kind of nibble a little bits off that agreement that you then keep and you can uh, uh, maximize further down the track. There's a huge variety of terms there, Carol, to be quite blunt with you. Um, some writers will, will um, strictly... Um, limit the rights for which their product can be used. So copyright is is a funny thing because it's actually divisible. You can say it can be used for certain purposes and not for other purposes. And, uh, or it can be even, even in territories, copyright, you can, you can grant, assign your copyright for use in a territory, not other territories. So copyrights are an interesting thing. Um, so if you're, uh, if you're, as I said, if you're, this is your first work, um, then first of all, yeah, you're going to be asked to assign a copyright. Secondly, they're probably going to say to you, um, you're going to get paid, um, that, will, that will be it. You, you will then want to negotiate a, uh, a reasonable credit because that's often what gets you, um, gets you seen the next time you go on by uh, other producers. Um, early on, you're not, you're not going to get um, a share of back end. That's not going to happen. Um, you should seek to negotiate um, a at least a first negotiation right for um, for further writing for things like sequels and spin-offs. Um, again, um, that's quite likely to be given to you by a producer. Um, whether they give you a, a matching right on that um, depends. Normally, that's just a negotiation right. Um, and obviously, but if you're the person who who has um, given them a program that's successful, that's actually quite a valuable right. When you deal with copyright and the law, it's important to know your definitions. And Rob mentioned two things in there that uh, uh, jumped out. One was first negotiation right. So I asked him, what exactly does that mean? First negotiation right basically says that if the producer wants to, e.g., um, uh, produce a spin-off based on the program that they've produced using your script, uh, then then you have uh, they have an obligation to consult you to seek to reach agreement as to the terms upon which you will then be engaged to write the the script for the spin-off. 
Now they can they can seek to negotiate with you. Um, and if they can't come to an agreement, then first negotiation rights mean they're then free to go off and ask somebody else to do the work. Um, so again, even first negotiation rights may have the the attachment to them that they can't do that um, if they're going to offer the the person they they bring into it um, a better deal than you get. So that's it's sort of it's it's a non-binding type arrangement uh, on the producer. Uh, mm. Last matching right goes one further and says, well, if they don't reach an agreement with you, they then go to somebody else and they do have a basis for agreement with them, then they have to come back to you and offer you the the uh, the rights to do what the other person did on the same terms. Ultimately, there are easy ways for the producer to circumvent some of those. Uh, the, the, as, as Rob says, these are not binding agreements. If you don't have a good relationship with a producer, you're better off to go somewhere else because it won't be it won't be a happy time. Um, I think the reality is that the producer will find any reason not to use you. Um, you're better to move on. In a minute, we'll talk about script registration, but I wanted to see if everyone is still with us, whether everything's been clear, uh, or whether you guys have any questions about what's been said so far. I actually registered with uh, New Zealand Writers Guild uh, yep. because I was living in New Zealand at the time, and also with Screen Rights in Australia. Yeah. Um, and it was at the point where I'm, I was starting to pitch and send out to people. I'm finding with production companies, as soon as you ask them for an NDA, they get quite indignant and stop talking to you. Um, and yeah, some, uh, I still wanted to send out to some people. So it's peace of mind for myself in case it comes back. Yeah. Um, and very early on, um, when I was at film school, we made a very short, uh, afternoon thing that ended up being a Schweppes commercial. So we earned, learned very early on that um, it went, and it was sent off to Schweppes as an idea from uh, someone that you also probably know. And it ended up being a, a very hefty advert. So very early on, I, I learned the hunger for creativity isn't always met with uh, integrity of business. Your primary concern is to conserve that copyright and, and, and deal with it in a, in a responsible manner. And Nolene, where did you register? I registered with uh, Guild in America. Yeah. Um, at the it was fairly early in my career. And at the time, very similar to the Schweppes commercial, my girlfriend's daughter had was at um, fashion design school and had this design, which an American fashion company offered her a thousand dollars for and she said no this is going to be my ball gown anyway next thing she saw it was an exclusive twenty thousand dollar ball gown for somebody else and she saw it on one of the american actresses and she was a bit peeved so, um, so, <laughs> so she lost out because she hadn't copyrighted it and um, they just took it imagine that a script at the time and I thought oh, I'll copyright this but then I haven't copyrighted anything else. People call it copywriting it but that's not what you're doing because you're not copywriting it. It is already copyrighted. The moment you write it, it is copyrighted. So you're not changing anything to the status of your rights. Um, and uh, Rob will elaborate on that and Rob will explain what the, the point is, what the use is of registering because there is use. Part of the chain of title process is, is getting someone uh, like uh, Thomson Reuters to do a copyright search. And if you've got your copyright work registered with one of those bodies who are known to have uh, registers, then it's more likely to be, to be picked up uh, as part of that search process. So the advantage to you then is that if, if there is someone who is actually uh, taking your work, for example, and seeking to promote it as their own, then that process can actually expose that uh, that mis misuse of your work. So that's the advantage. I think there are advantages in doing that. Look, there's also an issue just of, I think, credibility. Um, if, you're, if you're registering with the Library of Congress, then it does show you've got a bit of uh, uh, substance to what you're doing. Even if you're, you're, a, you're a beginning writer, you can do that because it just says, okay, these people have got some idea of, of knowing what they're doing and the value of what they're writing. So 
Look, it doesn't happen, I, I'm telling you now, it doesn't happen very often with, with lots of work. Screenplays are the main thing that they get registered with the Library of Congress. We had a second, uh, next question. That was a question from Alison yesterday. She is writing a, um, a true story. And in that story, this from her own experience, other people appear. And her question is, when you, when you write biographies or stories in which living people appear, do you need to ask their permission to write about them? It's, it's generally speaking, it's not necessary. Um, there's, there are some, <clears throat> some issues in the US as to the, whether a person has their life story rights. You might have heard that. Um, you need to be cautious there. But generally speaking, no, it's not uh, necessary to seek their permission. Um, why it's desirable in some respects, there's two reasons. Uh, number one, um, you've got to be careful what you write if it can be clearly identified to a person because you then move into the area of, uh, of defamation if what you are saying is in some way defaming them. Um, you also move into that area of, uh, potentially the area of what they call passing off, that is that you're, you're indicating that what you're doing has been, uh, has been approved and sponsored by those people. Um, so they're good reasons to, to seek to get them involved. The third, the third one in terms of credibility, if, if you're trying to relate it to a true story event and you can get the endorsement uh, of the person to say, yes, they approve of what you've done, they couldn't do that with the Crown apparently, um, then, then that gives it a bit more credibility. That's all. But, but, but yes, you can you can write about true events and what have you, and change names, and you don't need to get the permission. There's reasons why it's desirable, but not necessary. Next question comes from Shauna. At what point does the issue of copyright kick in when you're doing screenwriting specs for things like um, competitions and samples for industry? Um, so. For example, if you're writing a spec script and you might have a quote from someone, potentially um, idea, things like songs or even um, ideas or concepts that might have been in fragments of pieces you've researched, are you, can you be in trouble at that point or does it really only sort of start to kick in as a concern once that piece is going um, to be potentially bought or actually made into it? Because I assume they do lots of development work even after someone's interested in it, don't they? So lots of stuff would change. I'm trying to fully understand what you're saying. You mentioned competitions. Um, I gather that's you're saying that could be a source of which, where you get materials from. Look, Sean, the short of it is if you're using someone else's material in order to produce a bigger work, you actually have no right to use that uh, unless they consent to it. Uh, unless what you've what you've taken from their material is so different in terms of the words you've got there that it, that it's it's really not recognisable as being a, a similar work. So it's all it's the old lawyer thing. Look, it's a matter of case by case and degree. Um, but if if your intention is I'm going to take this material they've created and put it with this and it with this and this with it, and then come up with a greater work, then you need the consent of those people to do that. Don't leave it until the end because you may not get that consent and all your hard work's been for nothing. You wind up with a product that you can't use. Competitions, you need to be wary of competitions and, and carefully read the terms and conditions because uh, there are occasions, uh, I think there's still some, some consumer protection laws about their unfair contract things, but there'll be cases where if you submit your work into a competition, um, you actually are, are assigning that work to the runner of the competition, uh, often for a period of time, uh, if they want to use it. And so my word, my only caution on competitions is, is the old one from the way, read the terms and conditions very carefully to know what you're doing. Does that help you answer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I was saying things like other people's, you know how screenplays will sometimes have quotes at the start you know, that, that are to do with the theme of your piece. Oh, okay, yep. Yeah. So yep. obviously if that was going to actually be made into a film, would they they would check that that's okay, yep. wouldn't they? Or is that at, at the point you write it? If you're, if you're quoting someone uh, in anything, then it depends whether that language is still subject to copyright. So mm -hmm. if you're, if you're uh, quoting Charles Dickens, there's no issue because that's public domain. 
Mm. But if you're quoting someone who's written something recently and you're using that in quotes, you need their permission. Thank you. Um, before we go to our question about script editors from Bruce in Canberra, also in Canberra, I wanted to go back to Tanya's uh, chat here because um, while Rob was speaking, I actually remembered a case that relates to uh, what uh, uh, um, Tanya brought up here. I was under employment with the Belgian National Radio and Television when I created music that I then used in my radio shows. Uh, so I had an employment contract and this is a, a company whose business it is to create copyrighted materials being their programming because the programming itself is copyrighted. I was under employment and I created music and I still claimed the full copyright on all that music and I earned money from that. So it was entirely my own. And the reason being that I, I created this after hours and also, it was not part of my job description. So writing the music, although I was going to use that music in my own shows, um, writing that music was not part of my job description. So I, I retained my full rights and um, uh, even was, was, was able in one year from the proceeds of that music to buy a nice car. So uh, I think that's probably a good example. Now, another point Tanya makes here, she says, I've heard that when a publisher goes bankrupt and a book can no longer be produced and sold, the author cannot just take the script to another publisher. In the film industry, this happens almost every day. Companies go bankrupt and then the rights of movies get stuck in the proceedings. Um, sometimes these are good movies. I remember I was in London working for a company and I had screened a film that I really wanted to buy. By the time we were going to contracting, the company had, had gone bankrupt. And I believe it was uh, a company that George Harrison was, uh, I think it was Handmade Films. I think Handmade, no, it was not Handmade. It was another, a different company that uh, George Harrison had been involved with. Same company that financed the first Monty Python film. And here was a, a different comedy that I thought was outrageously funny and we really wanted to buy it. But the company went bankrupt. What happens then is the, the rights are being treated as one of the assets of the company and they, they then uh, go to the creditors. Now, if, these, if the creditors don't agree on what's going to happen with that film, nothing can happen. And the film is stuck in limbo for probably as long as... Um, the, the, the copyright law says 50 years or 70 years after the death of the, um, of the, the copyright holder. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, copyright gets stuck. Nothing can happen with it. And that's why certain films sometimes disappear. They're simply no longer available because a company goes bankrupt. Um, Nolene asks, can you use words said on a public platform by someone famous, for instance, politician? Um, Again, I'm, I'm not a, a lawyer, but my gut feel answer is yes, because that's public domain. Uh, public figures cannot claim copyright to what they say unless they're quoting something that is copyrighted in the first place. So if they use words that they've written in a book, then that would become uh, copyrighted material. But sentences and words, uh, quotes, are not copyrightable uh, as they are produced, um, if they're not written down. If they're not a quote from a book, is copyrighted, but a quote that is spoken off the cuff uh, publicly, I don't think that is copyrightable. But that's my, my opinion. You need to seek legal advice if you're going to think of doing this in your work, um, Nolene. So we're going to this question from Bruce about script editors and the law. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, people who want to be script editors or developers, is there anything they should be uh, keep in mind to protect themselves. I mean, you've, you've got multiple writers coming in, you're seeing multiple scripts. Um, and if, yeah, if someone goes, oh, hang on, that was out of my idea, you know, is there any way you can protect yourself? Bruce, that area is a bit of a minefield. Um, if you're, if you're a, uh, a, the writer and you're involving a script editor to come and work on your, on your um, product, uh, my advice to you is that they actually sign a script editor's agreement to start off with 
which basically says, if you can, that the results and proceeds of what they're providing by way of their service belong to you. Otherwise, you do run the risk of winding up that area where you've got jointly owned copyright in a single work, and, and that can become impossible to exploit if the two copyright owners can't then agree on what, may, what, what should be happening with the copyright. That's one of those problems with our copyright law is that it needs the consent of all copyright owners. So uh, my advice to anybody who's involved in the script editors is you have a script editor agreement. If the deal is um, that they're going to own it jointly with you, that's fine, but at least record that because otherwise you just create a confusion later on as to who's going to own what. I've got a, a situation right now um, where I've got clients who produced a, a treatment for a particular uh, project and, uh, and they've, they've done a sizzle reel uh, and now they're bringing in a, a production house who are going to um, uh, refine and revise both those, both those two items. And we've got the contract from the production house saying, well, you'll own your intellectual property and what you've done to date, and we'll own it in front what we have done to date. And, uh, and I think to myself, well, what happens when this show doesn't get up? Who owns what? Have you actually killed the project? So I've, I've gone back and said to, the, uh, to my client, uh, you go to the production house and you say to them, look, I'm sorry, but we've done all the work on this. You're adding to it so you can go and pitch it, and that's very nice of you, but we need to own the copyright in this so there's no... There's now a confusion later on as to who, who can do what with what. And I have a telephone call next Monday morning with their lawyer uh, to talk about my, my amendments. So okay. I think the answer is get it clear who owns what up front, Bruce. Thanks, Robert. Um, book adaptations. From, from what Rob said so far, it, uh, it seemed to me that when you want to adapt an existing literary work, there's really nothing you can do with it before you get the permission from the publisher or the, or the author or whoever holds the copyright. When you speak to lawyers, they're always going to be cautious because they don't want you wasting your time, which you don't know you've wasted until you get further down the line. If you're clearly going to be using another original work in order to make an adaptation, whatever you're going to write, a screenplay and what have you, then, then the sensible course of action is to actually get the rights to do what you want to do uh, from, that, from the owner of that work up front. And then you don't have those sorts of problems. So, uh, you know, getting buying book rights when you're going to write a screen, et cetera, or film rights from, from, a, from the owner of a, uh, of a book, um, who often is the publisher who has those rights, not always. Um, get those rights defined up front. Um, so you, you actually get an option for the rights. So often you can, you can simply get an option for the rights. So you might pay a small amount of money for it. You do your work. You get the opportunity then to perhaps pitch your work. And then if, in fact, there's clearly a market for your work, it's at that point in time uh, that the option to acquire the rights you need to do what you've done um, hits in and you've then secured those rights. So, you don't, again, it's a matter of, getting a, a, a purchase agreement, we call them, um, in place um, or getting an option to purchase the rights so that you can enforce that uh, once you've done some work. And obviously there's an issue of cost involved in that if you've got to pay uh, upfront a lot of money that makes it difficult, but if you can get an option for a small amount of money for a period of time that gives you a chance to do what you want to do, then that's going to be more affordable. It seems the more you listen to lawyers that there's really nothing you can write down without running into trouble, except if it comes out of your brain and it is truly original and yours. However, information is free. Information is, um, is exempt from copyright. Now, I've got an anecdote, and if we have time, I'll share that with you because it's an interesting one, um, where it became clear that there is a gray area. There's, the, the line is not always clear between information and copyright information. So I put, I put that question to Rob. Information is what's out there in the ethos. It's often in the mind. It's, it's things you pick up along the way. It's once you take information, then you put that into a particular form so that it has a certain uniqueness about it, then it becomes copyrightable material. So they, uh, when, you, when people write textbooks and what have you, they own the, they own the script of what they've written, but the information there is in a public is, is available for use to the public. There is an issue of uniqueness in terms of copyright, and that's it's at that point in time when you take generally known information 
and put it to, into a format that brings some uniqueness about to it, that may well be in the context of a storyline that you've written that it then becomes a copyright material. But look, it's a, it's a blurred line. And, uh, and I still say to people, if, if you're going to write it down on paper, then assume that that you, ha you have the copyright and you need to establish the copyright in it. So the final question from yesterday's Masterclass comes from Alison. Thanks so much again for giving up your time. Very appreciated. Thank you, Alison. Um, and you answered my questions earlier about the Inspired by True Stories. But when you said earlier um, it's a good idea to get legal help from the get-go so that you're on the right track from the very, very start, would that time, would that first time be when a contract is actually sent to you, like when you're buying real estate? Sure. I think from the get-go doesn't mean as soon as you start putting uh, words onto a page or onto a screen list nowadays. You don't need to be involving lawyers there most of the time. But if you are using other material to be able to get those words on the page, then uh, it, it, it probably is a time to use a lawyer from the get-go to make sure that you're not using that other material uh, in a way which breaches the... Um, the copyright of somebody else in that material. So it depends what you're doing. If it's a purely, um, I'm starting this from scratch and I'm not using anything else type thing, uh, or it's just an idea or it's public information, go for your life. It's, it then becomes relevant only when uh, you want to start uh, ex exploiting that or a producer wants to start exploiting that, that's down the line. But it, it really depends on the circumstances. The lawyers say it all the time. Uh, if you really are doing something that, that has some questions about whether you have the right to use material which you're going to utilise to create your material, then it's probably worth just a phone call to your lawyer saying, listen, I'm about to write this screenplay and, uh, look, I have this stuff here. I've got these notes or this diary or those sorts of things. Um, that's worth a phone call before you put your pen to paper. All right, and that was the questions. That was our masterclass about screenwriting and the law. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give us a like. If you want to see more of these masterclasses, just subscribe to the channel and we'll notify you when the next one goes up here uh, on the channel. There are many more masterclasses, but there are even more that you won't see on the channel. Those are the ones that you can attend live if you subscribe to our masterclasses by checking out the information you'll find below the video window in the information box. Check us out next time for our next masterclass. I hope you enjoyed this one and I hope to see you next time. Bye.